All right, seeing that it is 1.30, we are going to kick it off. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is Eric Haugi, Executive Director of Homeline. And today we'll again have managing, Homeline's Managing Attorney Mike Bra field uh, some questions from participants regarding tenant landlord Minnesota rental rights um, during the pandemic. Um, we did have folks, uh, as you registered, submit questions in advance. So we have maybe a dozen of those that we'll start with. Uh, but at any moment, if you have a question, please send it in over the Q&A system uh, or over the chat is fine. Or uh, we'd very much appreciate if anybody wants to, you can raise your hand and we'll call on you and, and bring your audio in for a question as well. Um, again, Homeline, we are a statewide nonprofit organization that provides free legal advice uh, and education for renters throughout the state. And uh, just, a, just a couple days ago on Monday, we actually hit our quarter millionth uh, client that called the hotline and uh, since opening in 1992, we've now served over a quarter million renters throughout the state. Um, we do serve uh, folks in four languages, English, Spanish, and Somali, English, Spanish, Somali, and Hmong. Uh, and the numbers will be on the next screen here. And our staff includes attorneys, advocates, organizers, and volunteers and interns. Here is the in contact information for our hotline. Um, and if you dial the main number, you will get language prompts for each language as well. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Homelines Managing Attorney Mike Bra to kick us off. Thanks, Eric. Uh, and thank you all for joining us once again today. It is May 6th. 2020. Um, this is the third week in a row that we've put together uh, this session, which we are envisioning as much more of a question and answer session than just a straight lecture. Uh, the first one of these that we did three weeks ago, we spent the first half hour talking about the rules. I'm going to spend about five minutes more or less updating you on what we know about the current rules today in uh, the COVID-19 era for landlord-tenant law in Minnesota, which is what we work in. To start, again, still, evictions are not uh, really very fileable, is the word we've been using. Uh, more accurately, they're not really schedulable for a landlord if they wish to file an eviction right now. Again, evictions cost about $300 for landlords to file. If a landlord were to file an eviction right now, uh, it's not exactly clear what happens to that eviction if they were to file one today uh, because of the governor's moratorium, which has essentially said evictions can't be filed right now. So technically a landlord can physically file the eviction, but it won't get scheduled. And we don't know if it will just get dismissed if it were to be filed right now or not. So for all practical purposes, evictions in general right now can't meaningfully be filed. And the governor's moratorium is actually tied to the declaration of the peacetime emergency that the governor did uh, back in March. Uh, and uh, that is, has been renewed by the governor and is uh, set to expire on May 13th. That is when the peacetime emergency is set to expire. However, the governor has the power to renew that peacetime emergency and has done so once already. The legislature could step in if both houses, both the House and the Senate at the Minnesota level were to uh, decide to stop the peacetime emergency. They both have to say, we need to stop this um, by a vote. Uh, otherwise the governor has the power to extend it again. We have been asked multiple times by multiple different people, will the governor extend the peacetime emergency and make the moratorium on evictions last further than May 13th? And the short answer is we don't know. Um, we've heard rumors. Um, I don't know that we've heard any substantial rumors that the governor wouldn't extend it. We have heard some rumors that the governor will extend it, but we really don't know. But it is set to expire, you know, just a week from today is when it is set to expire. So we'll hopefully by this time next week, know the answer to that question fully. Uh, but that is the main change in landlord-tenant law in Minnesota, mostly because that is the main remedy that landlords generally have against tenants. If a tenant is not paying their rent or if they're breaching their lease in some other way, the traditional remedy in Minnesota law is for the landlord to go file an eviction, UD, unlawful detainer. Again, they're all the same thing and ask the court to remove the tenant. But right now, 
a landlord simply is not allowed to really make a, an eviction happen uh, for a very, except for a very few limited number of cases where the tenant is endangering the safety of others, or if there's illegal drugs, illegal weapons, um, prostitution or stolen property found on the property. Um, those are the only ways a landlord can file an eviction meaningfully right now. And uh, the eviction courts have essentially been stopped since the middle of March. A uh, couple other things that we always like to touch on is uh, tenants are allowed to move still. Uh, the governor's issued, I think, over 50 executive orders now since COVID-19 kicked in. And uh, the first shelter-in-place order was unclear whether a tenant could actually move or if somebody was buying a new house, if they could move into that new home. Um, we actually pointed this out to the governor's office, as did, I'm sure, others, and said, hey, look, a lot of people move. This was back in March. And then the governor issued an order saying, yes, people are allowed to move into places that they were planning to move into. So tenants are still allowed to move if they've given a notice to vacate. We'll be coming up on the end of May is the next one that really matters. Tenants tend to move the end of the month um, and they'll be allowed to move into their new place on June 1st. But the, the overshadowing question about all of this is can the landlord file an eviction against the tenant again for non-payment of rent or if they do something else wrong that traditionally a landlord would be able to file an eviction for. Another issue, we have taken uh, a lot of calls. We actually track how many people call our office. As Eric just mentioned, we hit the 250,000 call mark on Monday. That's forever. We've been open since 1992. Um, since the COVID-19 virus has taken hold in Minnesota, we have taken over 1,150 calls uh, where the COVID-19 issue was brought up directly by the tenant or it had a significant impact on their question. Um, and so this is absolutely something that we are dealing with on a daily basis. One of the issues that has come up repeatedly has been when the landlord can enter the rental unit. Uh, again, we, we have always tracked the reasons why people call our office, and we have about 75 different reasons that we keep track of. Um, and privacy, which is how we've labeled that uh, question for forever, is uh, now the number two or three reason people call us. It used to be the number seven or eight reason people call us. But since COVID-19, a lot of calls about privacy. We actually created and published a, what we called a position paper on the privacy question, whether a landlord can come into a rental or when they can come into a rental, trying to address that uh, issue as well as we could um, in the current circumstances. There's nothing in a governor's order that specifically mentions anything about when a landlord is allowed to enter or not. So uh, we're left with trying to piece it together based on the statute and whatever case law might exist on that statute, which isn't a lot, frankly. Um, but anyhow, we have a position paper on our COVID-19 main page, um, and, and just, Eric just, has posted that in the uh, web webinar chat section, so you're welcome to link to that to see what our answer has uh, consistently been since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic entered our lives. But those are the main things that I wanted to make sure we touched on, uh, so, sort of an introduction to where we are. But as Eric mentioned, we have about 12 questions lined up before this began, and then we're going to start to take questions that people are sending in. So Eric, All I'll right, let you so, go yeah. ahead and ask the first question if you're ready. Here's the advanced questions. Uh, how are month-to-month -month rental slash tenancies impacted by COVID-19? Uh, the biggest impact on the month-to-month -month rental, I think, is that um, a landlord might not be able to give a notice. So the governor's moratorium on evictions also uh, has a moratorium on the landlord, and this is oddly phrased, terminating the tenancy, I think, is the phrase that the governor's order uses. Um, and so the question is, can a landlord terminate a tenancy in a month-to-month -month rental? Normally, if a landlord wanted to ask a tenant to move out in a month-to-month -month lease, all they'd have to do is give the right amount of notice. It would have to be in writing and it would have to say, hey tenant, you have to leave by the end of the next rental period. So today being May 6th, the landlord could say, tenant, you have to leave by June 30th. But uh, as we have seen, some landlords had given notices for the end of April. Uh, they were properly timed, they were in writing. Pre-COVID-19, they would have been valid notices to vacate or non-renewals or notices to quit. They go by all kinds of different names. Um, but now the landlord clearly can't enforce that that uh, that notice to vacate. 
telling the tenant to vacate by April 30th. On May 1st, if the tenant is still there, the landlord's traditional remedy, again, we always go back to that traditional remedy, the landlord's traditional remedy would be to go file an eviction. In this case, it would be for what we call holding over, not for non-payment, but for holding over. But a landlord can't file that if the tenant was supposed to leave April 30th. So what if a landlord gave a notice to vacate for the end of May? Again, they gave it properly timed and it was in writing, the two key criteria. Would the tenant have to go at the end of uh, May, if the landlord gave that to them back in April. If the governor does not uh, extend the moratorium, uh, that gets a little bit tricky. If the governor does extend the moratorium, that's an easy question. The, the landlord can't enforce that notice to vacate. They just don't have the power to. On June 1st, it would be. Uh, but if the governor does not extend the moratorium, then that gets a little bit trickier. Our view of reading the governor's order is that a landlord terminating a tenancy now, even saying it for a future date is probably violating the uh, governor's order. Um, we have asked the attorney general's office about enforcing this. And to date, I don't think the attorney general's office has stepped in to say that that's a violation of the executive order, but that's been our belief since the executive order was first posted. There have been no cases interpreting that uh, because evictions really aren't being filed right now. So it's difficult to know what a judge would do with that. But uh, if I were a tenant, that certainly would be the argument I would make if a landlord gave me a notice to vacate telling me to leave by the end of May or the end of June and it was properly timed and it's, I'm supposed to leave post the eviction moratorium being lifted. Unfortunately, for a lot of reasons, the governor's moratorium on evictions doesn't run concurrently with the calendar months. Again, the moratorium on evictions that we have right now ends, expires on uh, May 13th. Um, and I think that's going to be that way going forward as long as the governor continues to extend it. We got kind of a, a very related question. Does having a Section 8 voucher change what a landlord can uh, do in terms of enforcing a notice to vacate? Um, the biggest difference with having a Section 8 voucher in the current rules that we're dealing with, and this is something I haven't mentioned yet, we've been talking just about state laws, is there's a federal law called the CARES Act. You probably heard it in either in connection with rentals or with something else, but it prohibits evictions from being filed um, for non-payment of rent uh, in all federally subsidized housing, including a Section 8 voucher, and even in privately you know, owned housing where there's a mortgage that's federally backed. So uh, a Section 8 voucher holder would have a heightened right of not being evicted, a landlord filing a case. A notice to vacate, though, I don't think there's any specific new rules for a Section 8 voucher holder on a notice to vacate uh, under the COVID-19 rules, whether at the federal or state level, if it's simply the lease has expired and the landlord wants to non-renew the tenant. The CARES Act is only about non-payment of rent, and the governor's moratorium might still play a role, but that wouldn't be Section 8 voucher specific. All right, back to the advanced questions. Um, why can't landlords be given guidance to distribute May rents at 50 to $100 a month into the future? Yeah, I'm, you know what, I'm not sure who sent that question in and I, I tried to understand what it was about. Eric, did you have any thoughts on what you thought they were actually asking there? I'm not, yeah, I'm not, maybe it's uh, about payment, asking for payment plans. Yeah, that could be. Uh, if anybody recognizes the question that Eric just read, if you could uh, type in in the chat or in the Q&A a little bit more about what you're trying to get to, we'll be happy to try to answer it. I'm just not sure what that is uh, really addressing. Okay. Sorry. Is gap funding still available for tenants? Um, so the answer to this is there, there was a specific program in Minneapolis that was about what was called Minneapolis gap funding. That, um, they they received over 7,800 requests and that that gap funding plan uh, is now uh, over. Um, I think, I'm not sure if they've handed out the money yet or not. I'm not sure if the city is going to do another round or not. Um, we have heard, so there's there was also a similar thing in St. Paul called the Bridge Fund and a number of other cities have, have enacted uh, funds that have been going to non nonprofits uh, um, and others. Uh, the most recent news is um, both Hennepin and Ramsey counties, they've received uh, COVID-19 related federal funding that they have now decided on a plan for handing it out. Um, I don't think the Ramsey County information is out yet, 
uh, but the Hennepin County uh, it, uh, link I'm a, going to put in the chat. So you can actually get emergency rental, apply for emergency rental assistance. Um, I just sent the link out. Uh, if you're in Hennepin County right now, uh, and that, 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 that has the instructions for it. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Our, our general advice is to call your county if you're outside of Hennepin or Ramsey, or I mean, call your county if you are to, um, and, and your city to see if there are uh, opportunities for specific rental assistance available. Short of that, there, you know, counties also have just regular emergency assistance funding, although I'm sure much of that is being used. Okay, um, the next question, can evictions start after May 13th? Uh, maybe, maybe is the short answer. Again, if uh, the CARES Act is intervening, if there's a federal subsidy and it's a non-payment of rent eviction, the short answer is no, or if there's a federally backed mortgage. If it's in Minnesota, a state specific question, there's no CARES Act involvement and the governor does not extend the moratorium, then as it stands on May 14th, a uh, landlord could go file an eviction for any of the reasons landlords normally could file evictions for, including for non-payment of rent which is why the governor's uh, decision whether to extend the moratorium or not is so uh, critical. Can, the, can a landlord extend a notice to vacate if the tenant has not found a new place? So what I think a landlord, I'm guessing a landlord is asking this question, maybe it's a tenant, I'm not sure. Uh, but I think what's being asked is what if somebody gives a notice to vacate for the end of April and the moratorium is in place, the tenant didn't find a new place, can the landlord give, a, does that notice to vacate automatically transform somehow into a notice to vacate for the end of May? Uh, it's, it's complicated, um, and honestly, it's difficult to be sure how that would play out if it were in court later on. But I think if a landlord really wants a tenant gone in that situation, um, they would not accept rent in May because if they accepted May's rent, then they've probably waived that notice to vacate for the end of April. That's how it's traditionally worked. There's been no new COVID-19 specific change in that waiver, which is what we call that, uh, where a landlord waives the right to evict for holding over by accepting rent in a subsequent month's rent. Um, so I, I'm guessing if somebody gave a notice to vacate that became effectively nullified by the governor's moratorium on evictions, uh, the right move, whether it's, uh, well, I think the landlord is the one that's going to care about this more, the right move would be for the landlord to give a brand new notice. At this point, they'd have to give it for the end of June because they would be too late to give one for the end of May. You have to give the notice to vacate uh, for the following rental period. So traditional leases start on the first of the month, so it would have to be given for the end of June at this point. Uh, all right, next question. Um, is a lease binding when the management left construction site out of virtual tour and failed to offer other available apartments? The only option to view prospective apartments was virtual tours due to the pandemic. And they, they purposely left out um, the view out the window of a construction site. What rights does a new tenant have in this situation as they were misled and steered into a rental? Um, and this is before they've, they've moved in totally yeah so this is a <clears throat> pretty new phenomenon the concept of virtual tours and tenants signing leases sight unseen i mean it did happen before COVID 19 but i would guess it's certainly less than five percent of lease agreements in minnesota where the tenant never saw the place before they in person before they signed the lease probably a lot lower than that but now in our modern world uh many tenants are taking places without actually seeing the rental unit or at least seeing the inside of it. Um, my advice to tenants that are thinking about renting a place but are nervous about doing the actual in-person showing is to, if possible, still see the physical structure, right? Go see the building itself, get an idea for the neighborhood, whether that means driving around or walking around that neighborhood. Or um, One of the tips I've always told people when it comes to trying to get a, a rental housing is it's great to go meet with the landlord at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday or 10.30 on a Tuesday uh, and then if you ask about things like parking, is there parking? And the landlord says, well, especially in the metro area, look around, there's plenty of street parking here, there's no issue. Is it quiet here, you ask? Yeah, sure, listen, can't hear anything. 
It's very quiet on a Tuesday at 1030 in a lot of residential areas. If you really want to get a sense of what the place is like, uh, go to the place again at six at night on a weeknight and see if all that plentiful parking is still there or are people, you know, doing that musical chairs thing where they're trying to find any place to park their car. See what the neighborhood sounds like because that's when it's alive. That's when people are most active, you know, 6, 37, 8 at night, uh, especially on warmer nights like uh, tonight looks to be. Um, but uh, a landlord hasn't really got any kind of affirmative obligation to tell a tenant everything. They can't mislead is what they're not allowed to do. So if a landlord says, hey, here's a picture of what the living room looks like, and you take the place with only seeing the living room, it's a tough argument to say uh, as the buyer that you were misled. If you, if you ask a specific question, landlord has has there ever been bed bugs in this place? And the landlord says, never. There's never been a report of bed bugs in this place. And later you find out that that's untrue. Then there's all kinds of footing that a tenant has legally. But uh, unless there are specific direct questions asked, it's very difficult to go after a landlord for misleading somebody on a rental. Now, they can't lie, obviously. Uh, I, and I've dealt with cases over the years where landlords have promised to have a pool. They'll have ads, uh, Sometimes in, in pharmacies, they'll have the for rent magazines still in the lobbies where they'll have pictures showing what the place looks like. And it'll promise that this place has a pool. Tenant moves in in March. Uh, the landlord assures them that the pool was going to be ready. But in fact, the pool never gets opened that, that year. Um, and so the, landlord, the tenant might have an argument that, hey, you know, the main reason I took this is because my kids could swim in the pool and the pool wasn't open all summer. Uh, I want some compensation or, or something else. Um, so... On some really basic level, there's a buyer beware aspect to the, the question that's being asked, which is, you know, hey, I wasn't told about all the adjoining buildings and all the construction going on. Um, if you can show some sort of, like I said, intentional misleading or dodging a question, then I think the footing starts to get a little bit better, but it takes something like that to uh, really have an argument against the landlord in that spot. That being said, you're a paying customer. Once you get in there, you can say, hey, I was never told about this. I... I can't stand all this noise and dust and everything like that. And I want something back for putting up with it, or I want to try to get out of my lease. I mean, landlords may decide to let somebody out of their lease over that. It probably depends mostly on how much the rent is and how easy they think they could re-rent the place, uh, which is how most landlords decide whether to let somebody out of a lease is, is it easily re-rentable or not. We got some clarification about the previous question about distributing may rent set. Uh, oh. I think it is a question about about payment plans. Uh, the example is for some public service or uh, emergency assistance type programs, um, security deposits, There's uh, landlords are required in some cases to take security deposits uh, like over time, over the first three, three or six months, $100 a month or something to, to pay up, uh, not instead of all at once. So why couldn't landlords let rate, late rent for April or maybe divide it up into the future at like $100 a month? Well, landlords certainly can do that. Um, in my mind, uh, deals are going to be struck at, at two times, generalizing here, with tenants and landlords in this COVID-19 era and thinking ahead to the post-COVID-19 era. Um, so the first approach is the tenants are going to approach landlords now, or landlords are going to approach tenants now, or the tenant's not able to pay the full rent. And the tenant says, I can't give you full rent, but I can give you some of the rent. I can give you 600 out of a thousand and I can give you that until this thing ends and I'm back to work. Um, and then the landlord and the tenant strike up a deal. Usually the landlord is waiving the late fees if the tenant agrees to something like this. And the tenant is making payments by the day they say they'll make them. And we're seeing these new sort of, um, modified leases going forward. Now, the landlord's not saying you don't owe me that 400. They're just saying, we'll figure out how you're going to pay that 400 later on. Uh, and that's probably how they're going to get resolved later, is once people's income stream starts to return to normal, hopefully sooner than later, then uh, they will set up deals like that where they'll pay their normal thousand each month, but then they'll also pay 100 or 200 more to get caught up over time. Um, because a landlord knows that uh, the tenant doesn't have the giant stack of money to pay when the eviction moratorium gets lifted. So a landlord is really going to be uh, forced to make a choice when the eviction moratorium gets lifted with tenants who haven't paid all or a portion of their rent. Their options are going to be to either try to work out a payment plan of some type with that current existing tenant 
or to just go file the eviction. Now you might think, well, why, won't, why wouldn't landlords just run down to the courthouse and go file an eviction? Isn't that in their best interest to get the non-paying tenant out and replace them with somebody that could pay? And that might be the best move for a landlord from a business standpoint, but it might not be. And the reason why it might not be is if the landlord files an eviction, first of all, there's a cost. Like I mentioned earlier, it's $300 for a landlord to file an eviction. That's just the court cost. If they hire an attorney, then we're talking another $300 to $700 probably on average for most attorneys. Uh, they have to serve court papers, another $100 roughly. So it adds up to some real money pretty quickly. So the landlord's even further in the hole at this point. And if a landlord does file an eviction and they win, which we'll assume for a second that they would because it's a non-payment or rent case, the tenant doesn't have the money, so they're likely to win the case. It's going to take them about 20 to 30 days to win the eviction, but that's, that, that's the old version, by the way. It might not be as quick once we actually restart evictions at some point whenever that happens. But if the landlord wins, what they win, if they win an eviction, is they win an empty rental unit. That's it. Evictions are about possession. The easiest way to understand what happens in an eviction hearing from a really hard, you know, what's the legal status that's changing or happening here is who has a right to have keys? And that's what a judge decides in an eviction hearing. Now, a lot of tenants end up winning an eviction by paying what they owe. That's called redeeming. There's a legal word for it. It's called redeeming or redemption. But that's not technically winning an eviction. Uh, it's kind of sort of settling it or paying what's owed. But if a landlord wins the eviction, what they win back is they win possession. And that's it. They don't win money. If they want to try to collect money from the tenant in Minnesota, they'd have to go file another case, probably in small claims court, or I guess in district court, if the bill is high enough, can sue up to $15,000 in small claims court. Um, but they might not ever get that money. If they, even if they win the uh, small claims court, conciliation court case, uh, and they get a judgment against the tenant, that doesn't mean they'll ever collect the money. And landlords generally know this. They know that if they go kick somebody out through an eviction and then they chase them later on in conciliation court for the money, that the odds of them getting the money still aren't great. They're gonna have a judgment. And that's all they'll have. Now that judgment can have an impact on that tenant's credit going forward. I'm not gonna say that it doesn't have an impact, but it's something that a tenant will pay off if and when they have the ability to, when it, if and when it makes sense for them to do it. Um, I, <clears throat> I don't have any idea, nor does anybody, how long this is going to go on. But at this point, I have to assume that there are going to be millions, if not tens of millions of bankruptcies filed if things don't change drastically when the COVID-19 uh, emergency is over and we're on to phase two of whatever's next. Uh, and why that matters here is because a landlord should know that if they chase that tenant out, there's a real chance that a bankruptcy will be filed by that tenant later on and that debt might be essentially wiped out. It's not technically how it works, but practically it is in many cases. So uh, if a landlord wants to get paid, this is the long version, if they want to get paid once the eviction moratorium is lifted, I want to try to recover any of the money that they've lost over the months if you had a tenant that wasn't paying or didn't pay everything. Probably the only way they're going to get that is if they work out a long range deal with that tenant. Uh, and again, landlords are going to have to figure out whether it's time to cut their losses or try to recover what they can from that ongoing tenant. I imagine it's going to hinge like it almost always does on how believable it is the story's tenant, the tenant's story is that they'll be able to pay everything going forward. So if the tenant is saying, I'm hoping to get money, you know, I've got some relatives that might chip in, the landlord's probably unlikely to say okay to that unless they see the, the cold hard cash. Uh, if the tenant, however, says, you know what, I just restarted my job, uh, I got a letter from my boss or an email, here's my old pay stub, here's the email saying that I'm going to restart again, uh, this is going to be my wage and I'm going to go full time, then that's the kind of thing a landlord can latch on to and say, okay, you're not hoping, you've got a plan in place and I think based on your plan, we're going to be able to get this settled up over the course of five, six months. So I think we're going to see a lot of payment plans. Uh, and I'm not saying that every tenant's going to live up to them, but landlords in many cases are going to have a very strong self-interest in having a payment plan, which is uh, as, as somebody who has worked with tenants for since 1996 and I've negotiated and helped tenants negotiate literally thousands of deals like this. That's what I always try to find is why would a landlord say yes to this? What reason would a landlord have to say, okay, and you have to figure out a way to get them to that point. You can never count on, I mean, some landlords are very compassionate people and they're going to do whatever they can to help a tenant in this situation. 
But you can't count on that. You can't count on a landlord just being compassionate and waiving a, a big bill. Uh, they've got a mortgage to pay and it, it's just not a very realistic hope. Versus saying to the landlord, here's what's in your best interest. And it, you know what, it happens to be in my best interest too. Maybe we can get a deal put together, uh, which is what I'm hoping is going to happen uh, a lot when the eviction moratorium is lifted. That is going to be an incredibly time consuming endeavor for a lot of people, for tenants, for landlords that have a lot of tenants, uh, for places like us where we work with tenants and, and we try to help them figure things out, legal aid, social workers. There's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna have those conversations. And well, we can make generalities about how these things might work, and I just did. They are very case by case specific. And if I'm a social worker or a tenant, I'm trying to sell the landlord on a payment plan. What landlords want are dates and they want something to base that, that hope on more than just hope. They want some sort of certainty. The new job has started, it's official. You're gonna be back in the income stream, whatever it might be. Uh, that's what they're gonna be looking for. And that's when the eviction moratorium is lifted, I know that that's what we'll be doing for you know, a solid month, trying to help people wade through that with landlords. Sorry, long answer to that question. Uh, the next question is, is sort of just a general topic. Missed PHA, Public Housing Authority, and subsidy recertifications. Um, I'm gonna, in the chat, link to HUD's one kind of one page basic um, document around CARES Act and rent changes. But I think the short answer is tenants who've lost a job or lost income um, can and should ask for immediate interim certifications to get their their income changed. And if you're a voucher holder, you're also covered under you're covered under the CARES Act. So the landlord uh, cannot evict for, um, until uh, after July 25th and a 30 day notice into August for non payment. For non payment. Right. Um, the next question is is that, did you have anything to add? Nope, that was it. Sorry. Um, uh, can a landlord still evict with cause during COVID-19? And we have a related question that was asked earlier. Does, would this still apply if the tenant was being told to leave because of an issue stated in state statute that gives seven days? So I don't, that's kind of a two-part question if you put them together. Okay, so I'll, I'll answer the seven-day one and then re-ask me the first part because I know, I know the answer to the seven days one and I've, I've already shelved the other one uh, in my mind. Uh, the seven-day uh, statute that somebody's asking about is um, the one I mentioned briefly earlier. It's about drugs, guns, illegal guns, illegal drugs, uh, possession of stolen property or prostitution. There's a specific law that was passed in the early 90s, kind of in the war on drugs era, where uh, a landlord is allowed to file an eviction if a tenant violates any one of those rules. Um, it doesn't have to be enough drugs to resell. It can be a grain of marijuana left in the ashtray from a week ago or whatever. Uh, it's a real hard and fast rule. If the, if the rule is violated, the landlord has a right to file an eviction. A couple weird things about that seven-day rule. It's seven days. It happens really quickly. A normal eviction, as I think I mentioned earlier, takes 20 to 30 days on average for a landlord to get a tenant out in Minnesota. One of these... Um, Drug evictions, they're almost always for drugs, uh, can happen in five to seven days if the landlord goes as quickly as they possibly can. Another odd thing about them is somebody else besides the landlord is allowed to file the eviction. It's the only time that that's true. A county attorney can step in and file the eviction against the tenant on behalf of the landlord if the landlord is nervous about filing the eviction, if they think it's some sort of drug lord and they don't wanna be the, the one who signs the eviction, then the landlord might ask the county attorney to step in and file the case on their behalf. But yeah, that's the 504B-171. If somebody wants to look up the statute, that's where you'd find it, the seven-day rule. And yes, that is referenced in the governor's executive order uh, where a landlord could file an eviction for that reason today. They don't even have to wait for the eviction moratorium to pass. Can you give me the second part of that question, or the first part, I should say, Eric? Can, can a landlord still evict with cause during the, during the pandemic, I guess? Yeah, so I assume what that means uh, is that somebody's saying, hey, the, the tenant violated a term of the lease, um, like they had a dog and they're not supposed to, or too many occupants, um, uh, an unauthorized occupant, usually a boyfriend or girlfriend living with somebody, is probably the second most common reason landlords file evictions after non-payment of rent in Minnesota. Right now, a landlord can't really file an eviction for those things, for the dog, for the, the unauthorized occupant, for the loud party. Those don't work. Landlord can't really file those evictions till the eviction moratorium is lifted. 
And next question. Um, is it legal to tell a tenant that a no guest policy is in place and no guests are allowed? Yeah, this is another one of those questions that's been popping up quite a bit uh, since COVID-19 happened. We dealt with it before this. It used to happen, uh, but now we're getting quite a few more calls about it for obvious reasons. People are nervous about having anybody there. Uh, I'll start with the old rule, which is it's really difficult for a landlord to limit guests. This happened once, uh, ooh, wow, 15, 16 years ago, I want to say. A landlord in Bloomington uh, was having all kinds of problems with behavioral flare-ups on their property, giant property in Bloomington, right off of 35W. And uh, they decided one day to just ban guests. <laughs> you couldn't have a guest. This is a market rate place, uh, you know, average rent. Uh, and they said one night, you know, we're banning guests. You can't have a guest unless you get our written permission first. Um, and uh, I can remember that and just thinking, oh, well, okay, let's just analyze this. First of all, does a landlord have a right to ban guests? And the short answer is, yeah, they probably do, but not in the middle of the lease. That's the real problem a landlord has, is you can't just change a rule like that in the middle of the lease. Because first of all, most tenants wouldn't agree to that term in a lease. I can't have guests unless you approve them in writing. Is that any guests at all? I can't have somebody deliver a package. I can't have a friend come over. I can't have the girlfriend or boyfriend come over at all without your written permission. Most tenants wouldn't agree with that. Uh, the bigger problem though is changing the lease in the middle of the lease. So now we're in COVID-19, can the landlord change the lease in the middle of the lease to change their guest policy? And the short answer is probably not. There's no specific new rule from the governor. There's no specific new legislation. There's no city rules that I've seen that have said anything like that. So what we're left with between the landlord and the tenant is the contract. That's it. And that's all that either one can really rely on in that question uh, about whether guests are permitted or forbidden or not. And I, I don't see any leases uh, like that where the landlord has the right to simply stop all guests from coming in. And that would have had to have been in place beforehand. Now, if a landlord wants to create a lease right now saying you can't have a guest until I approve them and the tenant agrees to it, I think that's fine. But I think that's unlikely that a tenant would agree to it. And the landlord trying to institute a rule like that in the middle of the contract uh, shouldn't be enforceable. Um, and what, what would the landlord do? Go file an eviction against the tenant for having a guest? They, they can't file the eviction anyway. So, Is it any different if uh, the tenant, uh, it's a landlord-tenant assisted living setting? Well, there, I mean, there can be like a domestic abuse uh, shelter provider will traditionally have rules, really strict rules about guests. But again, that's going to be in place beforehand. It's not going to be in place in the middle of the contract. Uh, and so... If it's an assisted living facility, it needs to have a limit on guests at the beginning, not just because they snap their fingers and say, we want to institute a rule right now. Is there any recourse for tenants who have applied and paid deposits on a rental unit, but the, the landlord rescinded? Um, oh, sorry, but maybe, yeah, sorry. They've, they've applied and they made deposits on a rental, but then they've effectively lost their job. Hmm. So they want to get out of their lease that they've signed and they might not have even taken possession yet, but they want to get out of the lease because of COVID-19. Is that what you think the question is? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there has been no order from the governor or the legislature about getting out of a lease for COVID-19. It's one of the things that we've gotten, again, a lot of questions on. Um, we've had, in fact, sort of stretching this out, plenty of people, tenants that were planning to rent in university areas um, next fall. Uh, many college area landlords now ask for uh, certainly returning students, uh, along with prospective new uh, tenants, to sign leases for the fall of 2020 and that they might have signed back in November of 2019, 11 months in advance. Not exaggerating this. This is actually being done in a lot of college areas. There's, there was some legislation at the state level to try to minimize this, but We've got tenants that we're talking to right now that signed a lease four or five months ago that's supposed to start in August and they're wondering how they get out of that lease. Right now, there's no specific law that says a tenant gets out of a lease for this reason, uh, that they can break their lease automatically. A tenant can just refuse to go and if the landlord re-rents the place, the tenant's off the hook because the landlord can't get double rent. But what if it sits empty? The landlord is gonna have a claim against the tenant for that full lease, most likely. Um, and it is, there are some very complicated legal arguments 
to make that the lease was somehow impossible to live up to for the tenant, but it's not a sure thing. I mean, if I were a tenant and I were in that situation, knowing what I know about the rules, I would make the argument, the, somebody wants to look up the Latin phrase, it's called force majeure, um, and you'll find sort of an impossibility slash act of God concept contract theory where somebody says I can get out of a contract because of this sort of thing. But I can't tell you how it's going to play out in this setting right now. I don't know if this is going to be declared to be that level or not. Um, if a tenant isn't going to take a place, my, my starting advice is to tell the landlord right now, as soon as he can, I'm not moving in uh, at the hope that the landlord will be able to re-rent to somebody else. Because like I say, when they do that, then the tenant is off the hook, the one that wanted to break their lease. But if a tenant doesn't tell the landlord, uh, then the landlord can't re-rent. They don't have the right to. They've already got a locked-in contract. So the only way the landlord can actually solve this for the tenant is if the tenant's really direct and upfront and saying, I'm not going to be able to take the place, sorry. And you can chase me for money, but I don't have a job. So it's probably in your best interest to try to get somebody new in there. And the landlord almost certainly will try. Legally in Minnesota, they don't have to, but they will try just because business-wise it makes sense. But uh, I, I would, again, tell the landlord as soon as possible to try to get them somebody else in there to, to stop the, the liability. Just a clarity on the pre previous question about uh, guests. There's um, somebody asked about in certain subsidized housing settings, there's requirements that if you have a guest for a certain amount of time, then they have to be added to the lease. So that right, could, in theory, right. could be a, a lease violation, but you'd also be probably be impacted by, well, you're impacted by both the CARES Act and the, the state. Well, the CARES Act wouldn't matter there because That's it's true. just about non-payment of rent. But uh, a landlord couldn't, and I know what the questioner is asking about. We see a lot of leases that limit the number of days somebody can be uh, at a rental on or how many nights they can stay over. Uh, and again, that if you violate that, then the landlord's remedy generally is to go file an eviction for an unauthorized occupant. If there's a, a subsidy of some type, there might be additional problems that the tenant has not disclosed whatever income that person might have if they're living there. So there are additional concerns that I have that aren't just landlord tenant concerns, but might even bleed into criminal law concerns. Um, so it's not something I'm encouraging people to do, but could the landlord file an eviction right now for having somebody stay with you for 28 days? Not unless they're endangering others. Uh, that's what it would take. Um, eventually they could file an eviction for it, but uh, not right now they can't. It's covered by the state moratorium. Uh, question, a uh, case manager, housing case manager has found out that a landlord they work with that houses many of their clients is going to be filing evictions on all their clients at once. All these have some sort of subsidy. Is a landlord able to do that just because they're on the subsidy? And how can we get proof that they're able to or unable to? So this, this, so, could, this could be like a local state subsidy, but still probably unlikely under the state. Well, subsidy. first of all, a landlord couldn't file an eviction right now. Uh, until the moratorium is lifted. If we're talking about the day after the moratorium is lifted, could the landlord run down and file eviction against everybody at once? Uh, sure. Um, then we have the question about the CARES Act though. Is there a federal subsidy involved or is there federal backing? Um, and if so, then the CARES Act intervenes and then the landlord can't file the eviction until July 25th. And then they have to give a 30 day notice as well. So it's really August 25th before they have the right to file an eviction under the CARES Act. So if there's the federal subsidy or federal backing at all, then the CARES Act kicks in. But I assume that landlords, when they do go file evictions, they're gonna file all of them at once. Um, most landlords that have any number of properties, if they get over you know, 200, 300 properties, they file all their evictions on the same day. Uh, they only have to go to the courthouse once, if they're gonna be going to the courthouse. I'm not sure if it's all gonna be done electronically or not. But they want to have appearances scheduled. If they have an attorney, they don't want the attorney driving back multiple times. They want them to be able to show up once and deal with all 20 cases at once. So uh, it would not surprise me at all. In fact, I would expect landlords filing uh, mass numbers of evictions to file them all on the same day, uh, just because it's seen as landlords as more efficient and there's nothing that stops them from, from going that route. Somewhat related question that was sent in is that the state and the federal eviction, so CARES Act and then what governor's 20-14 suspension are different. And so how do we reconcile the both of them? And this is an issue that we have uh, been talking about quite a bit and mentioned at the legislature that if, if Walls's order opens up evictions for some units in our state before the CARES Act, which is July 25th plus 30 days, 
there, there will be, there could be a lot, uh, just mass confusion in, by tenants, landlords, and the courts. Right, right. We're, we're estimating <clears throat> somewhere, I think it's got to be at least 20% of the rental housing in Minnesota, and maybe as high as 50% of the rental housing in Minnesota would be covered by the CARES Act. And so that should be, uh, if there's a non-payment or rent eviction filed on May 14th, if the moratorium gets lifted on May 13th, um, there should be the first question that the judge or the referee asks uh, is, hey, landlord, is the CARES Act involved here? Um, and we've, we've heard rumors from other states, well, we've seen other states that are requiring um, landlords to affirm to state under oath that the CARES Act does not apply to them because if it's a federally backed mortgage, it's almost impossible for the tenant to learn this. Uh, there's not some simple website search you just do um, to find out if it's a one to four unit building, does that landlord have a federally backed mortgage or not? It's maybe unfindable for that tenant, um, but the landlord can find out. They can go to their mortgage company who does have to disclose it to them and they'll find out pretty quickly. So what we're hoping is that Minnesota courts follow the lead of uh, what we've seen in Michigan and a court in Texas and probably some more by now where the landlord is having to affirm. Uh, and we've heard that the fourth judicial district uh, Hennepin County is going to do that same thing. So, yeah, last last week there was one state and one county court in Texas. This week, uh, my understanding is that there's five states that have done it statewide. Um, so it's there's more and more doing it because there's an understanding that the courts will uh, have a mess to deal with. Um, can a new landlord ask you for medical your your medical status as it relates to COVID before renting to you? I don't think there's any law that prohibits the landlord from asking the question. However, if they're making their decision based on what they perceive to be a disability, then I think the tenant would have a claim they could file with the Department of Human Rights um, would be my short answer. I think the Attorney General has started looking into this question. Landlords trying to kick people out because they've contracted the coronavirus or trying to refuse to rent to somebody because they've contracted COVID-19. Um, so that would be my short answer is I think that there's a claim in the discrimination world, a Fair Housing slash Americans with Disabilities Act claim that a tenant would have um, is the probably the right answer. It's not really a HIPAA thing, it's just a uh, the Fair Housing question. HIPAA is the uh, duty that somebody has your information has to not disclose it. That's what that covers. Oh, uh, we got a landlord question. It sounds like water bills have skyrocketed during the crisis. Is there anything a landlord can do about that? Sure. And uh, on a weekly basis, we've been talking every Wednesday at 1.30 to tenants and social workers. And every Thursday at 1.30, we've been talking to landlords. Uh, you're welcome to join us tomorrow if you're a landlord. I'll be happy to answer this question. We've seen a lot of this lately where landlords are trying to alter what tenants owe right now. This is the reason, too, is because utilities have increased more power, more gas. Uh, I know that in my house, where it's my wife and I, we have two kids, we wash the dishes a lot more than we ever used to. And, you know, along with a lot of other things that we're doing at home, because we're, we're uh, locked into the house like so many people are right now. But if the landlord has a lease, a written lease with the tenant, and it extends, let's say through the summer, which most do, July or August end date, and the water was included as part of the lease, I think from a landlord's perspective, you're just kind of stuck with that heightened water bill. Um, there's not really any rule that says you get to change the water bill because the water usage has shot up. Uh, unless you could show that the tenant is willfully or maliciously or irresponsibly using the water at this point, I think it's your bill to absorb uh, going forward. Now, next year, you might change the lease. You're going to raise the rent to to recognize that the water bill is higher, or if it's possible, depending on where you're at and the kind of structure you have, to simply say that water will no longer be included in the rent. Um, if that's a possibility, landlords might try to pass that cost down that way, which many do. But no, a landlord can't change that water bill um, in that way during the middle of the contract, if that's what we're talking about. Can you talk more just generally about non-renewals issued during the pandemic for after the thir after May 13th? Right, so non-renewal, again, if a landlord gave a new notice to, uh, to non-renew um, in April for the end of May, 
uh, then there's a gray area in the governor's eviction moratorium. Does that notice get rendered uh, moot by the governor's order that says you can't terminate a tenancy during the peacetime emergency? Our view is that that notice to vacate is defective. It's going beyond what the governor allows. But we can't tell you that a court has said that because it hasn't come up in a court yet. Um, again, if the governor extends the moratorium another month, then that uh, notice of non-renewal or notice to quit would basically be wiped out uh, at the end of May. Uh, June 1, the tenant pays the rent, the landlord accepts it, then that notice to vacate probably doesn't mean anything else anymore legally. Um, and so there's, there's some gray area there because the governor's order isn't specifically clear about that question, but uh, that's what we are best guessing at this point. Can a landlord of a housing program give a no notice after repeated violations, active warrants, potential drug selling? No, I think a landlord can give a notice. That's not really that hard to do. They can give a notice or an infraction or however they want to word it, a lease violation. Um, but the, the real question is, can they file the eviction, which is the ultimate remedy landlords have against tenants for almost anything in Minnesota. Um, and right now, what you've described here, repeated violations, active warrants, potential drug selling, I'm not sure that that gets there. I mean, you could try the eviction for that reason. Uh, say that, hey, they're seriously endangering uh, the safety of others. That would be the argument you'd have to make as the landlord, but it's not a sure thing. Um, under that seven day rule, a third part, so this is the 171 and the expedited hearing, a third party can bring the eviction if a landlord doesn't. Would a tenant in a building be able to evict another tenant for drugs, violence, et cetera, if nobody would deal with the bad tenant? Okay, I'm not sure if I use the word third party or not, but what I meant to say is that one third party can file the eviction, which is the county attorney, not a neighboring tenant. They can't file an eviction against a neighbor. It's, it's the landlord or the county attorney. That's who's empowered to file that eviction. So it's not just any third party that can file the eviction um, if there's a neighbor dispute of some type. And we have one more question. So if any, any, we have about eight minutes left. So if anybody else has questions, raise your hand or, or send it in via the Q&A or the chat. If a landlord owns multiple properties and one of them is covered by a federally backed loan, so it's covered by CARES, does this mean that all of their properties have CARES Act protection? I don't, I don't think so would be my short answer. I know that there's been questions. Uh, Eric, can you talk about the voucher question that we've dealt with, that we've looked at a little bit? Yeah, I don't know what the most recent news is, but there's, there's not a lot of clarity around. So th this, is, this question is more about different properties with loans. I'm guessing the answer is, is probably not that. Not that would be my them. best guess too. Right but now, yeah. the, the, the other question is, is around if there's, a, if, if there's a Section 8 voucher holder in one building, in one unit of a 20 unit building and, and there's only one or two, is that entire building covered? And um, there, you know, there's been illegal analysis sort of publicly around that, um, that yes, the whole building should be, uh, should be covered. But then there's been subsequent HUD guidance um, stating the contrary. So again, it's just another situation where there's, there could be a lot of confusion around what types of evictions can be filed and when. And I saw a couple of questions that I think you missed from the chat box. The first one was, is this being recorded um, so it can be watched later? And, and the answer is? Well, yes, the answer is yes. And, um, and again, uh, that link that I sent first, which I'll send again, our COVID page, um, that actually has, has a, a lot of information on that page, but sort of towards the beginning, there are links to our, uh, all of our previous webinar recordings, both the ones we've done on Wednesdays for tenants and advocates and the Thursday afternoon ones that are designed more for landlords and managers. And another we'll, question, question that I saw was, uh, should you get a payment plan in writing? Uh, if the tenant has a payment plan with the landlord, should that be in writing? Yeah, absolutely. I think for both sides, actually. It's not just for the tenant. I think the tenant and the landlord both have a strong interest in writing down what is being agreed to. And I'd recommend it for lots of reasons. First of all, I think it locks everybody in. It can effectively become a part of the lease, basically, if everybody agrees to it and they sign it. And I'll tell you what payment plans generally include. 
they have a couple specific references. First of all, it names all the parties. It says who the tenant is, who the landlord is. And it also talks about the lease. And the lease is definable by the property itself, so the actual address, plus the time frame of the lease. So if it's a one-year lease, you'd say the you know, 731.19 to 630.20 lease. Um, and so would, that's how we know what the contract was originally. And then it would say what's being agreed to, that the tenant was supposed to pay $1,000 a month uh, every month, but starting April, tenant couldn't pay rent, so they are, or couldn't pay full rent, so they're paying $500 a month in April until the uh, COVID-19 eviction moratorium is lifted, at which point, you know, there'll be a new agreement reached or, or whatever it's going to say. Uh, both parties sign it. Both parties put the date on it. It doesn't need to be notarized. It doesn't need to have a lawyer draft it. It doesn't need to be on legal size paper. Um, all it really needs to be is written down. And I think that's good for everybody. So everybody knows that they're getting the clarity of writing it down is why judges always prefer that sort of thing. A handshake deal, if a landlord and a tenant come up with one right now, which is happening, you'll have to trust me on this. Landlords and tenants are making handshake deals, not in person, but not actually shaking hands physically, but over emails or texts where they're agreeing to modify things or even on the phone. And judges are going to try to look and see if there is a text that's better than nothing. Uh, but a phone call conversation, all the judge can really do is ask both sides later on if there's a dispute about what was agreed to is, hey, what did you think the deal was? And then look at payments going forward. So if the tenant was paying $500 a month and the landlord was cashing the check and didn't seem to be you know, yelling back in texts or emails or whatever, maybe they both accepted the deal. Uh, the judge will look at subsequent performance of the new contract to try to confirm that that was what was agreed to. But short of that, the written deal is what judges are going to look at. That They always want to see evidence to show what was you know, agreed to. And by forcing people to write it down, it makes everybody just be as clear as possible. Uh, I can tell you, having written hundreds of settlement agreements over my career, um, the first version is almost never the final version. It's usually kicked back and forth where people hone things uh, until it gets to be the essence of what everybody's agreeing to. And so writing it down sort of distills things and it commemorates everything so nobody can say, oh, I didn't remember it that way because it's, it's written down. Not seeing any more questions, feel free to submit them. Um, we have a, a, just a few minutes here. Again, we will post the recording online and uh, also try to, uh, as many of the links and, and ref references that we gave, we'll, we'll have links by the video for that as well. A reminder that here is our hotline information, how you can contact our hotline directly. If, if you're a tenant, we'll get to you as quickly as we can. and. If you're a service provider uh, calling on behalf of a client, we do have a system to set up to uh, work with you and the client so that we can get authorization to talk to folks. And just to um, be clear, these are both free services. It doesn't say this on this page, but our hotline and our uh, email and attorney service are both free services. There's no charge for, for this work at all. And again, I, I sent a, a link in the chat box. Uh, we, our, our hotline took the uh, two quarter millionth call since opening in 1992, just uh, a couple days ago on Monday. Uh, when we started in 1992, we were a small office that just served suburban Hennepin County. And since then, we've expanded uh, to cover the entire state. And uh, in addition to our free tenant hotline, we do tenant organizing, policy advocacy, education, uh, like, like this training. So. Um, and we are, questions? we are planning to do this speech, uh, question and answer session next week. Uh, next week is the day, the 13th is the day that the eviction moratorium is supposed to be lifted or extended. So I assume that will be a dominant topic. Um, so I'm sure we'll be doing another one of these next week. Uh, and we'll continue to do these as long as the COVID-19, uh, pandemic is still affecting landlord tenant law. Um, and as long as the interest remains. Uh, but I think there was somewhere between 80 and 100 people watching today, so that certainly justifies us spending the hour, and we appreciate you taking the time to, to stay informed. All right, thank you very much for joining us today, and uh, maybe we'll see you next week. Have a good rest of your Wednesday. Bye, all.